All right. Good afternoon, students, parents, alumni, and faculty. Welcome to our virtual Macaulay Authors Discussion with Professors Ted Widmer and Eric Joya. Um, today, they're going to be discussing Professor, discussing Professor Widmer's new book, Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about both the speakers today. So Professor Ted Widmer is a historian whose books have explored the full breadth of American experience from earliest years to Lincoln and the Civil War and the Civil Rights era. Widmer has also been an active participant in the contemporary U.S. history from 1993 to 1997. He was a foreign policy speechwriter for Bill Clinton and a senior advisor for special projects. From 2012 to 2013, he was a senior advisor for Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. In the academia world, he's served such he served in such academic and research institutions such as Washington College, Brown University, and the Library of Congress. He was the first director of the C V Star Center for the Study of American Experience from 2001 to 2006 at Washington College. In 2006, he was appointed the director and librarian of the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University, where he led the initiative to digitize, digitize the library holdings and raise funds for Haitian libraries during the 2010 earthquakes. Um, in 20, from 2010 to 2015, he helped create and contribute to the New York Times Disunion, a digital history of the Civil War. And in 2016, Professor Widmer was appointed the director of the Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. In 2018, he joined our very own Macaulay Honors College, and he made lasting impact in the short time that he's been here. I had the pleasure of taking his Macaulay seminar, The People of New York City, in the spring of 2020, and it was a great experience for me. While the pandemic did cut our time short of the face-to-face -face interactions we had, his online classes still allowed my classmates and I to explore the history of New York and our place within it. Currently, Professor Widmer is developing a new humanities lab at Macaulay Honors College, and he'll be teaching the Macaulay Seminar Decisions 2020, the election in real time in the fall 2020 semester. His latest book, Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days to Washington, was published this spring. Um, and now our very own Professor Joya, a Macaulay professor and former city council member whose career illustrates what it means to be an active citizen. A Queens native, he worked as a janitor and elevator operator to fund his own college education. In 2001, at the age of 28, he successfully ran for New York City Council and served two terms representing the 28, 26th district in Queens, New York. As a council member, Joya advocated for the poor and wrote laws to help alleviate child hunger and to protect the environment. He served as a chairman of the oversight committee in the Investigations Committee of New York City Council, and he conducted over 50 investigations, leading to the passage of laws which protected homeless people from HIV and AIDS. He's active in expanding opportunity for residents of public housing. In, 20, in September of 2007, he was named one of City Hall's 40 under 40 for being a young, influential member of the New York City politics. After leaving the City Council, Joy accepted a role at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. He remains active in the community and serves on the board of several New York nonprofits, including our own Macaulay Honors College. Professor Joya teaches the Macaulay Seminar, Shaping the Future of New York City at Macaulay Honors College, which is an institution that encourages young adults such as myself to uptake our responsibilities as citizens of New York to leave lasting impact. Professor Joya is a key figure in helping us reach that goal. He passes along what he learned from his own and other political experience to inspire Macaulay students. He wants his students in, Macaulay, in his Macaulay seminar to see why every citizen should be involved in politics. In his own words, he points out, you don't have to be a politician to participate in democracy. The stakes are too big for us to be bystanders while others leave. My pleasure to introduce Professors Ted Widmer and Eric Joya. Thank you, Suhaima. Great to be here. Thank you, Suhaima. That was a very kind introduction. Ted, it is great to see you. Great to see uh, you. And let me just show everyone the book, uh, Lincoln on the Verge, 13 Days uh, to Washington. A president under fire, a nation facing economic struggles, and a nation divided at its core. Ted's book is, is more relevant uh, today than ever. And truly, Ted, you have written a book for the ages. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, Eric. It is really well done. And uh, for those of you who have not read the book, let me just tell you, it is extraordinary. The story just sings. Uh, the narrative comes right off the page and grabs you. And I think I learned something on almost every single page. Uh, so Ted, I have a lot of questions. Uh, okay. And so <laughs> to let everyone know the format, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Ted some questions. We'll, we'll have a conversation 
uh, and then we'll leave room, uh, plenty of room uh, for you all uh, to jump in as well. And, and Ted, you know, I've told you how impressed I am with the book, but I'm also impressed with your courage on tackling this topic. Um, to, to write about a figure as covered as Lincoln and find uh, new insights and new material is very impressive. Um, so I'd love you to just maybe just start by telling, tell us about your journey and where your interest began. Thank you for all those extremely kind comments, Eric. And I can't wait to see you in person, talk about it some more. And I'm willing to accept an invitation to come visit you in Florida any, any time. <laughs> um, and it's so nice, by the way, to just be connected to the Macaulay community through through this technology, it's um, as Suhaima said, that's how the second half of our class went along these lines. And while it wasn't as um, personal as being in a room together, it did work and the class succeeded and, and, and this is working and it's a great way to stay in touch. Um, well, I, I wish I could say, I knew that the book was going to come out at a time when it was relevant. It took, it took me so long to write this book it, it, there were many years I wasn't sure I'd even be able to finish it. Um, but at the moment it came out this spring, it, it did feel a little more topical than I fully understood when I, I started the book. Because that, as you said so well, it's about a president trying to unite a country that is extremely badly divided. And I, I now feel like the moment we're in is the second worst in our history. I, I, there were a lot of moments in the 60s and 70s where it felt pretty divided and other times since then, but it, it really is pretty bad right now. And, and, and yet Lincoln, I think, had it even worse. And he had all kinds of problems that we can't even imagine, um, including the fact that his own coalition wasn't very united themselves. And he had a long way to go to get to Washington. And he wasn't sure he could even get to Washington because Washington was in a part of the country that was much more against him than, than for him. So the train ride was more of an ordeal than I ever understood. And it, it becomes a kind of metaphor in the book for just how hard it is to go into politics and to serve your country and to have the thankless task, task of trying to keep a lot of different kinds of Americans united. And the amazing thing in, in a lot of ways for me with this book was the fact that he succeeded. I mean, we all know that he becomes president. As I really got into the research, I, I kept wondering, will he make it? Not only will I finish the book, but will he actually get to Washington? And uh, fortunately, he did. Well, and, and the journey is both a metaphor uh, and truly a grueling ordeal, which we'll get into because I mean, it really, I mean, it reads like a thriller. Uh, I, in my mind, I, I guess I have this Spielberg um, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis playing Lincoln, but after reading yours, I mean, I think we need Tom Cruise as he's on that train going through Baltimore, which we will, we will talk about uh, I don't think in a he's moment. tall enough. <laughs> with the hat. He's tall enough with the hat. Right, right. <laughs> um, but but before, before we get there, to the train ride, let's talk about the election for a moment, because Lincoln hadn't been in office for 10 years. Um, by no means was he a favorite. Um, and yet he wins. I mean, so do you want to maybe just set the stage there? Yeah, so one of the many things I discovered that uh, amazed me, and, and it happened over and over again, and I, I should begin by saying I, I had read a lot of Lincoln books. I've been a Lincoln fan since I was a kid. I began to read old-fashioned biographies for, for young, young children and Lincoln was present in those kind of books. And then I read about him in high school and, college, and I, I really thought I knew his story pretty well. And then I just kept finding surprises and made me realize I didn't know him that well. And that, that made me think it, it was a chance this book might, might do some good. Um, but one of the surprises was how little known he was on the eve of the year 19, uh, 1860 when he will be nominated and then elected. And in December 1859, just before 1860 begins, Republican leaders make a list of 21 possible nominees. And they have a feeling they're going to do pretty well in this election. 
And Lincoln doesn't even make the list of 21. So that's how obscure he was. He, he was somewhat known. He wasn't entirely obscure. He, he'd run for Senate against Stephen Douglas and had those debates in Illinois, which were somewhat known, but they were not, you know, he was not a nationwide name at, at all. Uh, and then even after getting the n nomination at the, the Republican convention in Chicago in May, still not entirely certain the Republicans will win, but the Democratic Party, which has been very strong for 30 years, splits in half. They too are splitting in half over slavery. E everyone is, is, is breaking apart. Every, every institution is, it feels a lot like the way it is right now. And because they split in half, that makes it much easier for Lincoln to win, and, and he does. And, but, but not by a lot. I mean, he wins with 39%. Put, put that in perspective. Right. What, yeah, what is, uh, I mean, is that the, the second worst vote total up to that point? Is that right? Very good point. 39.8% uh, of the popular vote, which is really pretty anemic. Second worst ever by a victorious candidate after John Quincy Adams, in 1824. And it's all the more amazing when you think it's Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln is just so famous and so admired and he barely won. And if he had not won, I, I think our country's history would be completely different. And I, I feel like it's, I can't quite say certain, but likely that the Civil War would not have been won in the way that it was won. And I doubt we would have reached emancipation as quickly as we, we did under, under Lincoln's leadership. So all these profound and fundamental changes came about from a guy who'd won 39% of the vote. It's, it's just incredible. It, it really is. And, and I think, I mean, incredible is, is probably the exact right word because so many Americans um, didn't actually believe the results, right? Um, I think you've got a quote from Nathaniel Hawthorne, Hawthorne who says, um, how could such a non-entity have found a way to fling his lank personality into the chair of state? He was unlooked for, unselected by any intelligible process, and unknown. I love that quote. That's a great quote. And Hawthorne is a very well-informed political uh, observer. I mean, he's a, he's a novelist, but he's deep in the political world on the Democratic side. And so for him to say, I've just never heard of this guy, shows how deep the obscurity was that Lincoln came out of. And even his fellow Republicans were kind of amazed and, and unimpressed. They most of them thought William Seward, New York senator and a former governor of New York, was going to get it. But all these little things happened. Each little thing was just the right thing to happen at that moment. And if the convention hadn't been in Chicago, I think Seward would have been much stronger, but he was a little weaker. He didn't have quite as many of his people in Chicago as, as Lincoln did. And so, the, and Seward was a little, he was just a shade to the left of Lincoln on the question of abolition. And mm -hmm. Lincoln is now famous as, you know, for, for emancipation, but he was considered sort of a safe moderate. And that felt a little bit more like where the, the center of the Republican Party was when they were looking for someone. Seward felt a little bit dangerous like he might move too fast. And we're now, we're now in this moment, which is exciting, but also very complicated, where everyone's reputation is, is up for grabs. And, and historians are in the middle of a, a roiling debate. And Lincoln often, it's hard to place in there because he, he can seem conservative and he can, there are some awkward statues that, I mean, very awkward, that are now perhaps coming down the way so, so many other statues have come down. But really what's amazing is how this unknown guy, like the Hawthorne quote, barely wins, and then he profoundly changes everything about the United States of America. You know, there was another point, which I wondered what your view on it would be, because I think you see it from time to time in modern elections. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. In, in my first election, um, uh, a friend of my family, right after I had won, 
was in a prominent elected official's office. Um, I'll give him up. It was, it was the, the postal guy. Uh, and he said uh, that he overheard their conversation and they said, you know, who is this guy? No one I know voted for. Um, and, and I think when you're an insurgent, right, when you're not part of the power structure, I wonder if that's a, a reoccurring theme in American history that, and, and particularly in times of, of stress, uh, economic stress or, or civil rights um, moments when the people who are powerful and influential begin to or are truly have lost touch with the people who are voting. Uh, right. And then you get these surprises like Lincoln. I think that's a really good point. He, it wasn't just that he was from the West, which was convenient in some ways, and it wasn't just that he was in the kind of center of Republican thinking on slavery, but I think he, you know, the fact that he was an outsider actually helped him. The, the American people were exhausted by 10 years of nonstop arguing between Republicans and Democrats, and, and, and they, were, they were not liking Washington, D.C. very much. I mean, you know, felt, felt like it does now. And so I, I was stressing how surprising it was that he was such an outsider, but you're absolutely right. I think that was a strength for him. And then it's a big strength on this train ride when no one has ever seen him. And he's suddenly a huge celebrity because he's won. And he goes through these teeming crowds of millions of Americans. And it's the, the most exciting political progression that has ever happened. It, it, it absolutely is. And uh, right before he begins his train ride, you have him in a small town. I don't remember the name of the small town uh, outside of Springfield where he, he uh, meets up with a bunch of, of young students uh, and, and he speaks to them. Uh, and at some point, he actually takes off his shoes and they walk around right. his shoes. And I think, what a great metaphor, right? They're walking in the president's shoes. And the moment I thought of when I read it, I don't know if you've seen, there's a photo of President Obama uh, in the Oval Office where a young boy uh, reaches up and feels his hair. I've that's, seen, I love that photo, yeah. Uh, and, and to me, you know, it's that young boy thinking, that can be me, right? For the first time, that can be me. And is and when I read these young boys wearing Abe Lincoln shoes, is that, in my mind, that's what they were thinking, right? Like, right. poor boy, working class kid, with, I guess we didn't call it working class back then. You know, he has actually um, achieved the highest office in the land. I think it's fair to call Abraham Lincoln working class. He was probably tied with Andrew Jackson for the the, the deepest poverty he came out of and the, the least education. So the fact that he pulled himself up by his bootstraps was really impressive. And, you know, we, we grow a little numb to hearing how great Lincoln was. We hear it from, you know, the moment we start reading history books. But um, I kept feeling inspired by his humility. And yeah, I love that story. That's a little town called Charleston, Illinois, where his stepmother lived. And he's in the final days. And a relative says, your, your stepmother's really worried about you. Can you just go pay her a visit? And that's not easy for he's got huge decisions already he's got to make, but he, he took more than a day to go there and back. And the, the train trip, it wasn't a very long distance, but the train broke down connections didn't work. It didn't even make it into the village. The train travel was primitive, which I wanted to use to set up how dangerous the, the trip to Washington would be. But then he had a great day and saw his stepmother, who was like a second mother to him. And then all these children, he took off his shoes and they walked in his shoes. And then he gave a speech that we don't know what he said. And I wish we did because he talked about being a little kid like them and what this woman had, had meant to him. She kind of saved his life after his mother died and no one recorded that speech. So it's, it's, one, you know, it's such a shame, but I like the story because I wanted to recapture what Lincoln was like as a human being. Um, mm -hmm. we, we think of him as the marble statue at the Lincoln Memorial or in these you know, kind of frozen moments in, in photographs. They're, they're interesting photographs, but still we, he's not moving. And, and as beautiful as his speeches are, they are, they can be a little cold too. And yet he wasn't a cold person. He had a 
fantastic sense of humor. As everyone said, he had an interesting variety of mood experiences. He could go down pretty quickly. And people talked about how depressed he would seem. And then he would come out of that very quickly and tell a joke and everyone would laugh. Um, but yeah, these ordinary interactions with children, there are a lot of with immigrants, um, with, with the elderly, with women, he's, he's, he's on with all these different types of Americans. And mm -hmm. as it turned out, he really was a very gifted politician, but that was a kind of politics we'd see more in the 20th century. And he's kind of inventing it in, in 1860s. Mm -hmm. Well, for sure. And let's talk about that. And then I want to talk about how he, in many ways, invents the 20th century, uh, at least from a democratic ideal point of view. So against all odds, he wins um, and now begins to set out on this journey. Now, remind us now, because the election, unlike now when we inaugurate our presidents in, um, in January, this was a March uh, inauguration. Right. And so you have this you know, big in-between space. Uh, and, and there's a question whether or, not, um, whether or not there'll be a Washington for him to even be inaugurated in. Right. That was another one of these big surprises for me as I really delved down deeply into the newspapers and the, the private correspondence of leading political figures. They, so, so Lincoln is elected on November 6th and immediately Southerners begin to say, no way, we're not gonna be a part of Lincoln's United States. They, some say they're going to secede, and quite a few say he won't become president. And it's mm -hmm. a little unclear what they mean. Are they going to work the rules of Congress to somehow declare a misvote? And these are all things, you know, I, I'm beginning to worry about in 2020 also, that the, the rules will be bent to, pre to prevent him from taking his office. Or will he just be killed on the way to Washington? But then another possibility that um, I, I, I read a lot about, really seems to have been a, a very near miss, is Washington is a Southern city. It, it is now, and it was even more then. It's between two Southern states, both slaveholding states. It's um, mostly on land that used to belong to Maryland, but a, a piece of the district had also been in Virginia, and it's right across the river from Virginia. So, Basically, the capital of the United States is owned by the South. And most of the people who live there are pro-Southern people. Um, slavery has never been eliminated from the district, although Lincoln is one of the few who tried to when he, he was a one-term congressman. He uh, introduced a bill that didn't go anywhere to end slavery in the district because it was just so embarrassing, a country that's supposed to be about freedom and, and democracy as slaves right there in the Capitol and in the White House. Um, so in late December of 1860, there are a lot of letters and, and rumors saying Southern militias, and you know, militias is a word we're hearing today also, but Southern militias are going to come in and take over Washington, D.C. and keep it for the future country that doesn't even exist yet, but will be the Southern country. And one of the possibilities was that they were going to just keep the name the United States of America. And mm -hmm. Washington would still be the capital of the United States of America, but the USA would be the Southern states. And it would have kept, they would have kept the Capitol, the White House, um, both houses of Congress, the Library of Congress, all of the treaties, all of the uh, patents in the patent office, really just the entirety of what the U.S. government was, would have been still based in Washington, but controlled by Jefferson Davis and South Carolina and all of their friends in the southern states. And Lincoln would not have been able to make it to Washington. So that, would, that was a fascinating alternative scenario. It sounds like science fiction, but it, it came very close to happening. And in the it very well could have happened. And I, I want to actually talk about the international element of that because, you know, I mean, I guess partly I've been watching Hamilton here with my kids uh, and I, I hear, you know, King George singing, uh, you know, you'll be back. Um, and, and this is just 75 years later, right? So um, right. this is that question of democracy. Um, 
and if they are in contact with with uh, with England, I mean, you could you could see. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Where England recognizing the Southern states as actually the United States of America. Right. Well, it was a hair's breadth away from happening. England really liked cheap cotton coming from the South. England had all of those textile mills in Manchester, Birmingham, and they thought, looking at the, the, the relative strength of the two sides, that the South looked pretty strong. And most of the military officers were Southern and, and the Southern leaders like Jefferson Davis had way more experience in office than Abraham Lincoln did. And so it came very close to happening, but that was one of the ways in which the, the genius of Abraham Lincoln begins to come out is as he gets on the train, he begins to um, humanize himself. He, he appears like a real person who you can relate to, which helped a lot with his domestic audience, including millions of people who had not voted for him, but, but maybe wanted to give him a chance. You know, that, that was an important group of people. They weren't Republicans, but they loved America and they wanted to see the guy who won get to Washington to become president. And I think that also affected and impressed foreign governments, but then the more he starts talking about what is democracy and, and why should we treat each other well in this country? Mm -hmm. That took the argument out of pure economics, in which case England, I think, would have liked the South, and pure power politics, in which case they probably would have thought, well, the South has a stronger army. Most of the US army is Southern. And then it became more about what is America to the world? And, and what did the Declaration of Independence mean? And, and why do so many immigrants like to go to the, to the United States? And suddenly Lincoln is looking much better. And he's telling a story that will become the great story of the 20th century of America as, the, well, I mean, even before the 20th century, the Statue of Liberty is built. Mm -hmm. and that is, in a way, New York City's version of America. And a lot of people around the world really believe in that. And Lincoln is starting to tell that story that we accept people from different countries we believe in freedom and we believe in equal chances. And the word equal is right there in the Declaration of Independence. And he, he hits it over and over again. And it's a brilliant, you could call it a lawyer's argument, you could call it a politician's argument, but it's basically just a human being's argument about what is special about America. You know, I, I'd say I thought this was the brilliant, one of the many brilliant points in the book, but that I, I just stopped while I was reading. I let it settle in that it was really, so if you think about how Lincoln saves America, but then in turn the world for democracy, it's first the victory, second getting to Washington, and then of course um, governing this nation through a war. But it was on that journey when he began to redefine the definition of America, right? right. Um, and, and as you so artfully do it, I mean, by the way, when you think about his stops, if you just pause for a moment and recognize that Abraham Lincoln was also pretty good at politics, right? Uh, is that the stops are Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey. <laughs> you know, some of those are still swing states. Um, and yeah, maybe talk about, you know, you know, why did he go through those states? And then let's begin to walk through the, the narrative he begins to craft as we look at ourselves anew as Americans. So yes, the route is fascinating. Um, I, I love every one of those stops. And part of the joy of writing this book, I mean, that's, I have to be honest, why it took me so long is I was having so much fun with the research. <laughs> um, but as you know, from your political life, different places, I mean, in New York City, a, a block next to another block can be different, you know? And, he was finding that out in, in the states and in the regions of the states, the southern parts of Illinois and Indiana and Ohio are way more pro-southern than the northern parts of those states. And he's going through both parts um, and he's discovering 
how complicated America was. Even in 1860, it's a long time ago, but there was a new economy coming in, an information economy, a, a petroleum economy was already pretty important. Um, so he, one of his challenges, he has to talk a little bit differently to each of those people. But then, yeah, as you, as you say, he's articulating a new set of values about what it means to be American. And, and the trip is heading toward, I mean, it, it, one of the interesting angles for me of this trip was, in a way, he's going backwards through his own personal life. He had come from Indiana into Illinois. Now he's going back to where he was a kid in Indiana um, and then back to Washington where he had been a congressman. But he's also going through American history backwards and, and he knows he's going to go to Independence Hall, which is where you could say American history begins. There are a lot of different arguments about when and where American history begins, but pretty solid ground to say Independence Hall where the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are signed. And he times it and here he's like, he's got the sharp instincts of a ward boss in, in New York City. Somehow he figured out or someone did, but I think it had to be him, that it was going to look good to go into Independence Hall on George Washington's birthday, February 22nd. And that's where he gives this beautiful speech. He, he's hinting at it as he gets nearer, but this beautiful speech about what the Declaration means to him and what equality means to him. And on the same day, Jefferson Davis, who's just become the president of the Confederacy, he could have given just as strong a speech about how the Declaration has a pretty strong pro-Southern message in it. It, it. it says, if you don't like the government you're under, you can make your own government. And that's what Jefferson Davis is, is doing. But Jefferson Davis, we don't hear a peep out of him. And Lincoln quietly but authoritatively gets this very pro-Northern message out, which is that we are a country founded on equality, that everyone has an equal chance. And it's like he, he is Harry Houdini and he changes the message on that day and suddenly a lot of people agree with Abraham Lincoln and his definition of what what it means to be an American. Um, and, and, and that is that speech which really does not you think of Gettysburg you think of Cooper Union but it really is here on Washington's birthday in Liberty Hall when right. when he recasts this message um, that, think, that we, we all now consider American. Right. It's just so modest, like he's just called on to speech and he speak and he gets up there for like a minute. But it, it's like a, a revolution has happened in that minute. I totally agree with you. And his, uh, it would, this, this road trip along the way, the road trip, you know, this train trip uh, to get there, he's not great at every stop though, right? I mean, th there are so many problems and it's, it, it is a road trip. I mean, that, that's a perfectly good, term to, to use. Um, sometimes they haven't planned for his arrival properly in, in one town in Ohio. They're all starving and they arrive and they're desperate for food and all the people in this town have eaten all the lunches that were just set aside for Lincoln. Um, there are dangerous moments. There are, um, well, in one case, an explosive device is found on the train just before he gets on in Cincinnati. Uh, in Buffalo, they have a crisis of crowd control. So even people who like Lincoln and want to see him begin to crush each other in the chaos of his arrival in the train station in Buffalo. And it was a very close call for him as well as for people in his entourage. And um, day after day, there was a, a factor of nearly breaking down. His, his own health was beginning to break down. Um, cities were out of control, states were not, many states were governed by governors who were not that excited to, to welcome Abraham Lincoln. So the whole thing is like on very thin ice, but he gets through. And part of the reason I think he gets through is he's, he's just going fast. He keeps getting on this train. And I was attracted to the train. I mean, I was attracted to Lincoln. I'm not ashamed to say it, but putting Lincoln on a train was appealing to me 
too. And there were moments, there were a few mo mo movies I, I thought of now, and then one was Speed with Keanu Reeves, where he's on that <laughs> bus and he can't slow down or, or the bomb will go off. And um, the National Lampoon vacation movies with Chevy Chase, where he can't even control his own family. <laughs> he does have problems with his poorly behaved children. Um, and with Mary Todd Lincoln throughout the journey, which sometimes adds a comedic element to, to the book. I mean, there is comedy in the book and tragedy too. Well, for sure. And you, you also, I think you did such a great job of bringing in these characters who history has not, you know, uh, written 50,000 uh, books on. Um, I'm thinking, and people who played instrumental roles in keeping Lincoln alive on his way to Washington. I mean, because, I mean, you mentioned the, you kind of quickly mentioned there's a bomb, uh, but I mean, this was a harrowing journey, um, yes. particularly in Baltimore. Um, and maybe, so we'll maybe talk about that, but then also maybe talk about uh, uh, Dorothea Dix and, and her role well, in, I'm so in saving glad, Lincoln. I'm so glad you asked about her. She's a kind of hero to me, heroine of the book. There are two women who basically save his life. And, and that was new to me also, even after reading all of these Lincoln books that um, none of it, the Lincoln presidency would have happened without these two women who basically stepped up and said, this guy's life is in danger and someone has to save him. So Dorothea Dix is a reformer from New England who's a specialist in mental health. Um, she goes around America in the 1840s and 50s and goes to state governments, North and South, and says, you, sh you should appropriate some money and build some hospitals and treat these people differently, give them therapy, or if they can't be cured, give them a nice place to be. And that's just part of being a civilized society. And she's accepted and, and even well-liked in, in the South as well as the North because she does so much good. And right around the time Lincoln's elected, fall of 1860, she happens to be in the South and she's in South Carolina, the, the most anti-Lincoln out of all of the, the states. And she just begins to hear all of these stories about how they're gonna kill him. And she begins to hear concrete details. And these plots revolve around Baltimore and train bridges coming into Baltimore. So she figures out who runs the, the railroad coming from the North into Baltimore. And she makes an appointment and this is a great lesson for Macaulay students. There's no one telling her what to do. She just figures it out on her own. She just, who's, who's the guy who runs that railroad? I'm going to go see him. And she just walks into his office. He's a powerful CEO of a major railroad. And she just walks in. And he later wrote down his impressions of that meeting. She never said a word about it. That's how cool a customer she was. But he later said, if she had not come to see me, I don't think Abraham Lincoln would have lived to become president. So he uh, knows a, a railroad detective named Alan Pinkerton, who lives in Chicago, who's an immigrant from Scotland. Immigrants are heroes in this book also. And Pinkerton comes and meets the head of this railroad and they agree that this is very serious and Pinkerton uh, comes back with eight operatives. So he's got a team of spies, basically. And they go into Baltimore and they pretend to be Southerners. And they infiltrate all the bars where Southerners hang out. And Baltimore is a Southern city anyway, just like Washington. And within a week or so, they have figured out every detail. They're incredibly talented spies. And you know, I was reminded a little bit about, you mentioned Tom Cruise, and it's a little bit like a Mission Impossible teeth uh -huh. that cracks the ring of, of the people who want to kill Lincoln. And one of the most effective of Pinkerton's ring is a woman from Chicago named Kate Warney, who impersonates a, a woman from Alabama, and she just hears everything. And so Pinkerton sends Kate Warney to meet Lincoln and tell him and his entourage all about the details of the plot. And they're a little stubborn. They don't they, they are hearing some rumors, but they don't want to change their plan. And after they hear from Kate Warney, and then they hear from a second person how serious it is, they decide the only way he can get into Washington is by sneaking in in the middle of the night on an ordinary passenger train, which is what he does. 
Um, but without Kate Warney and Dorothea Dix, uh, I, I, am, I imagine history would have turned out extremely differently. And that we had no rule in the Constitution for what do you do when a president elect is killed on the way to the office, especially if other states are beginning to secede. It would have been total, right. total chaos. Yeah. Total chaos, uh, potentially going back to what you previously said, which is the, the southern states taking Washington and being the United States, right. maybe a, a fractured country you know, to the west and to the north. Right. But if that happens, um, then fast forward to the 20th century, uh, is America in a place to step in against fascism? Um, is America in a place to actually spread uh, democracy? Um, likely not. So as a carefully trained historian, I'm not supposed to speculate wildly, but I, I did it anyway, I just did. Um, because it was interesting to me. And it was in my epilogue where I think you're allowed to kind of leave your main story a little bit and think about how history might have turned out differently. And I, I think in the short term, it, it not only would you have had two Americas, a Southern and a Northern one, but I, I think it would have been hard to hold on to the West because the, the argument for all being part of one country just would have been that much weaker. And California is really far away and not that well connected to the rest of the United States. It might easily have become a country of its own. Utah is extremely independent. It's founded by Mormons. They don't really wanna be a part of the US then either. And Texas isn't that comfortably a part of the South, although it does join the Confederacy. So you might've seen a splintering of, of different Americas all inside of what is now the USA. And I, I doubt you would have seen Alaska come in to, to the US. Um, but because of Lincoln, it all holds together. And a strong United States is, is still there at the end of the Civil War and then gets stronger in the decades that follow and then gets really strong. Um, I mean, we're, we're in a lot of doubt about our history right now. But the and, and that's, I, I think, a very healthy set of questions to be asking. But Nevertheless, the um, waging of war strengthens America over and over again. In the, the Spanish-American War of 1898 and then World War I, in which the U.S. goes in late but plays a very important role, and then more than any other role, um, war, World War II, where a global response was needed to defeat a global threat to democracy and human rights and the basic values of civilization. You know, that's the kind of threat we're up against. And the United States, as we all know, played an extremely important role in the winning of World War II. And it wasn't just how strong the US military was or the US e economy building all those tanks and aircraft. It was the rhetoric of democracy that Franklin Roosevelt could say that we are fighting for four freedoms and we're fighting against a fascist who hates freedom. And that was inspiring to peoples all around the world, including the peoples of the British Empire who weren't always excited about, about the British Empire, but they were excited to fight for freedom. So I think Lincoln's victory for democracy made it that much easier for Franklin Roosevelt to, to have another victory for democracy. Uh, it is fascinating and to think that it begins, that ripple through history begins with Dorothea Dix walking into the right. railroad, railroad owner's office. I mean, an exactly. extraordinary moment in history. I'm so glad you caught that, Eric. That's one of my favorite parts of the book. Oh, I loved it because I'd never heard it. Uh, and so I, I, there, I'm saying there really were so many moments in the book where I just paused and I reread what I had, what you had just written. Um, but so, but what also struck me, and I think this brings us to maybe some questions about today, which is the fragility of democracy. Um, and so we have that election in 1860, um, where, where, by the way, and we should touch on this as well, the, the media at the time, I mean, is... When we talk about Southerners, it's, it's not just some folks, you know, uh, 
at the local pub uh, kind of talking about this. Um, it's, it's mainstream newspapers of the day saying that Potomac will flow crimson uh, should Lincoln enter Washington. And so democracy is in jeopardy at that moment. Yes. That is safe. Um, and what I wonder, I may, may be asking a different way to, to get to modern times. In 2000, when Al Gore, who wins the popular vote but loses the electoral vote, uh, concedes his election. In 2016, when Hillary Clinton does the same. To me, the, those are wonderful moments of the transfer of power. Um, looking at 1860 and potentially 1864 had Lincoln lost, uh, or uh, pardon me, if, um, if the Southerners uh, tried, had won that war. Um, what does the, in other words, can democracy perish? Uh, it, it, could it actually happen? And when I look at a year like 2020, um, during a pandemic with write-in votes, um, what worries you about the current uh, political climate? It's such a good question. I'm so glad you asked it. Um, and I, I have strong memories of 2000 and 2016 when um, people I supported lost and the circumstances were were disturbing and and very complicated but at the end of the day in each case a democrat agreed to play by the rules as he or she understood them and and to accept defeat as 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 hard as it was for the benefit of democracy and and, and our country and i'm worried you know, and I should also say I have many friends who are Republicans and I have many relatives who are Republicans. My grandparents were Republicans, but um, I feel like we're in a weird situation now where I don't think the other side can be expected to play, to play by the rules. I'm, I'm worried that the election of 2020 will be close. And, and if it's close, that will legitimize President Trump's uh, expected effort to, to cry foul so that he will say there were, and I mean, I think he's in a way already laying the groundwork by saying you cannot vote by mail, therefore voting will be very chaotic. And you're telling people in the middle of a pandemic to go into a crowded voting station, that's going to cause problems, which he can then point to if he loses and say, oh, there were problems. There were long lines of people who didn't get in by 8 p.m. Therefore, it's a miscount, you know? And so that's not playing by the rules. What, what we need to do, what the founding fathers, I think, would have done, they would have said, we're in a really strange situation. Let's come together as fellow Americans, and create a blueprint that we all agree, and let's have a bipartisan commission to make sure it works. And we will all agree by the results, no matter who wins. And that's, that's America. But I'm worried we're getting into some very weird territory that will go well past November 3rd. And if there's an overwhelming victory for Joe Biden, I'm still worried about the capacity for a pr president to do damage to the government. He still leads until January 20th through pardons through um, um, a sale of public lands to private corporations, mm. the, the taking over of assets for cronies and for, for himself. I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm trying not to be too political, but um, That's okay. I'm worried about all those things. I'm worried that what worked for a long time in our history is both sides played by the rules. You, you, you play hard, but you accept the verdict and then you have another chance to run again. And, and somehow we've gotten off that. And, um, and we're, let's take, I'm seeing a bunch of questions coming from the audience and so we should go there in a moment. But on that, I wonder if that's also the power of your book, which is that it, it really does speak to the ages. Are there lessons there for, for all of us as citizens today, as political leaders today to say, these are hard times when, when people really are, um, where some folks are butting up against each other, but Lincoln um, both saves the nation and heals the nation. Yes, he heals it. That's a very good point. He heals it profoundly with his words and no one even quite knows how 
powerful his words will be. When he's on that train, he hasn't given very many great speeches. The great ones that we study in high school and college at Gettysburg or the, the second inaugural come later, but they are healing speeches. And, and in the second inaugural, he doesn't blame the South. He says, this war was somehow a result of American slavery, not Southern slavery. And that, that suggests that the North was involved and the North was involved with Southern slavery. New York City, as great a city as it was, was probably more involved with Southern slavery than any other Northern city at the time. And so he correctly says, we all are to blame. And then he correctly says, we all need to forgive each other and move on and accept each other. And I'm desperate for someone to come along with that kind of a message. And I'm not sure, you know, Joe Biden wasn't the candidate I really expected to prevail. And he's not someone with a history of speaking all that well. He's the president we've got right now. I mean, the president, the, the camp candidate we've got. And I hope I hope he wins and then I hope he heals us. And I hope it's not a time of democratic payback, but it's a time of building back of bridges to make this country truly great again. We can go to the audience for, for some questions. So we'll now go on to audience questions. One of the questions is the biggest difference and more obvious difference between Lincoln's time and our time is just the use of technology, whether it be social media or the internet. What differences do you think you would have seen if this type of technology was available during Lincoln's time, whether it's regarding campaigning, the election, or even the Civil War? Well, it's certainly true. Um, although I wanted, I tried to make a point in the book, which is that he's surprisingly wired. You think of him as just sort of out there on, on the frontier with an ax in his hand. And he's using the telegraph all day long to send messages back and forth to people. And so whenever he gives a speech from the back of his train, everyone he hears it. I mean, they read it. They read it immediately in the rest of the country. So he's pretty wired back to the rest of America. But Ted, I, on that, point, on that yeah. point, Ted, I will say, sorry to interrupt you there, is that, that to me, again, was one of your great points. And when I tend to look at politics and campaigns, um, I tend to think that the candidate or campaign that masters the medium of the day um, tends to win. Uh, yeah. that they convey their message. I think of Kennedy and television. I think of, uh, I think of President Clinton going on um, Arsenio Hall in, uh, in 1992. Right. I think of Donald Trump on Twitter in, in 2016. Absolutely. But I had never thought until reading your book of Lincoln with, uh, with the Telegraph. Because uh, he's giving these speeches to a crowd of 100 or 1,000, but the whole country uh, right. is reading. And I just want to give you one of the quotes you wrote, uh, which to the question, of media of the time. In 1858, the New York Times writes, will the news become too fast for the truth? Oh, I love that. Eric, you, you like all the quotes that were my favorites. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned how skillful Donald Trump was on Twitter because it's, it's absolutely correct. I said some negative things and so now I want to say a positive thing, which is he figured out a tool that no one had really mastered and he, he's brilliant at it, whether you like his politics or not, he has, he has mastered Twitter. And I, I would say generally the Republicans are better on all social media than the Democrats are, in, in my opinion. Um, you, you might wanna push back on that, Eric, but, um, but uh, I, I think Lincoln would be, well, there wouldn't be the snarky thing. So, what was impressive about Donald Trump was how quick he was, how in intimate he would make it. He would just put his emotions out there with a lot of exclamation points. And he wasn't ashamed to spell a word wrong or make up a word like Kovfefe. And I, he's smart <laughs> enough to know he was reaching a lot of Americans. He was one of them, you know, and that, that, it wasn't like an excessively manicured message coming from the White House. And I've, I've been a part of messaging from a White House. It could get pretty complicated in there. And tr Trump on, on his phone at 2 a.m., pretty immediately getting his message into the bloodstream. 
But what's negative is how, how mean he is just about all this. It, these are all always negative messages. They're always putting down Hillary or Barack Obama or the Democrats or, or um, the, the uh, Black Lives Matter protesters. And the negativity is overwhelming. And Lincoln wasn't a negative person. So, so I think he'd be shocked at that. And he'd, he'd be, even, even though I, I think he put more of himself into the message than had existed previously. And his farewell address to his fellow townspeople of Springfield is a very human statement. I'm a person, I'm saying goodbye to these people I love. Still, he wouldn't un understand how constantly personal you have to be with Twitter. He was a private guy too. All right, um, so the next question is today, Republicans and Democrats both claim Lincoln um, in their history as their, as their party's president. Lincoln ran as a Republican, but then again, in today's world, is Lincoln actually a Republican or is he considered a Democrat? Another great question. Um, I mean, he will always be the first Republican candidate uh, to win, first Republican president, not the first candidate. Um, and what he did, he, he really shaped the party in his own image and the party changed after his presidency and, and for a solid 60 years or so, you could claim if you were a Republican, you were in the party of Lincoln. But all of those categories changed a lot in the 50s and 60s and 70s, primarily because of the civil rights movement when the Democratic Party fell apart over civil rights and the South had had Democrats for a really long time. And Southerners who didn't like the civil rights movement begin to switch over and join the, Demo the Republican Party. And so that's the beginning of a new Republican Party. And, and throughout the 70s and 80s, you could still find liberal Republicans, moderate Republicans, state I'm from, Rhode Island, had a great Republican senator who I always supported named John Chafee. And his son, Link, was a Republican, although he later, like a lot of the liberal Republicans, he had to switch because there was no room for him anymore in the Republican Party. So I think the Republicans have by and large left the party of Abraham Lincoln that was also a Republican Party and there is no, nothing left of what was this party of um, fiscal conservatism. I mean, we now have the biggest deficit we've ever had. There's no such thing as Republican fiscal conservatism. Um, they were for a long time more progressive on race than Democrats were and until, probably until Harry Truman and there were imperfections in his strategy and then John F. Kennedy and there were imperfections in his strategy. But then over the course of the 60s with all of their troubles, Democrats really became the party of civil rights. And so I feel like it's kind of a sad situation. There was a great Republican party and what is left is a party that is largely run by uh, an alliance between um, the, the top 1% and the lobbyists whom they employ and then certain very powerful lobbies like the gun lobby or evangelical Christians um, or single issue uh, people who are obsessed with certain causes. And it's a, it's a pretty unhealthy group of people and not really representative of the nation. It was a better nation when there were Republicans in Vermont, which there were for a long time or in Maine there still are, but probably won't be uh, for too much longer. Or in Rhode Island, where I'm, I'm from, it was nice to have two strong parties in every state, and we don't have that right now. Mm -hmm. Professor Joya, do you have anything to say? Oh, sure. I, I know. Do you have another question? And I'll, I have another question as well. But uh, good. Uh, do you want to do another audience question, or do you want me to go? You can go. Yeah. Okay. Ted, you know, you mentioned New York City. Um, a couple of questions ago. And when I think of, you know, uh, when I have my, my class every year, I, I have them watch a couple of speeches. Among those speeches, 
I have them watch uh, Reagan's speech where he quotes uh, John uh, Winthrop Stimson and talks about America as a right. shining city on a hill. Uh, right. I think, by the way, uh, New York as that city, right? You know, if there's going to be a city, it is New York. Yep. Right. But then I show them as a, as a counterpoint, um, Mario Cuomo's speech, where he talks about a tale of two cities. Uh, and I ask oh, them to react good. to it. And almost always, almost always, um, the students talk about the aspirational city, the shining city, and say, I wish it were that. But the reality is um, we do live in this time and place where um, the inequities are savage. Um, yeah. and, and then we begin to talk about what to do about that. But when I, when I read in Lincoln on the Verge, and it's, to me, very striking, is that some of the evil that is perpetrated um, is not Ku Klux Klan with torches. It's lawyers and New Yorkers uh, speaking politely and intelligently about awful, terrible things. Yeah. Um, and, and the quote I thought, and I want to run it by you, this, this, it, there's a, a quote by a, a Jesuit uh, thinker, uh, Tony DeMello. It's that, that evil happens not because people want to be bad, but because they choose to be blind. And that's what occurred to me about so many folks in, in Lincoln's time uh, who, who opposed him, who tried to kill him, uh, who seceded from the Union all the while uh, claiming uh, the moral authority. So what did we learn from Lincoln on how to combat that? I love that quote and I love the question. And we, in, in my seminar that um, Suhaima was in, we talked a lot about that. I mean, everyone in the class was a New York, a New York City um, student. And yet there was a feeling that the city can be pretty distant if you're growing up in the Bronx where Suhaima's from or, or Brooklyn or Queens or Staten Island. The city can, can look pretty far away. And so how to keep New York um, as democratic as its message is, is, is an ongoing concern for all of us. And that's one of the reasons I'm so proud of Macaulay, Macaulay which is such a, an amazing engine of um, dem democratic fairness you know, justice and, and empowerment for young people. And it's just so inspiring to be a teacher. I'm sure I can already tell what a great teacher you are, Eric. And uh, it's just such a, such a pleasure to, to be in a laboratory of social progress as well as just a learning in, environment. Um, so that quote made me think of another one. Um, Dante had a quote that President Kennedy used to like to say, which is the hottest circles of hell are reserved for those who in a time of moral crisis preserve their neutrality. And that's, I think the same thing you're saying that there were a lot of people in New York in the 1850s who were perfectly content to just go along, that their livelihoods depended on the credit balance looking good. And when a Southern ship came in full of cotton, no questions asked, just reship it to Liverpool or, um, or to Europe and, and no questions asked, just keep the money flowing. And, and so one of our jobs as not only you and me as teachers, but for the Macaulay students and, and alums is to keep that better message in the forefront of our, our minds because New York isn't just a big city and a wealthy city. It's really in the center of the American story and the rest of the country looks to New York for leadership in every way. I and mean, we saw it in an exciting way when Governor Cuomo um, held all those briefings throughout the worst of the virus. And, and now New York is on the downward uh, side of the slope of the infections. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. But how New York behaves affects the rest of America and how America behaves affects the rest, rest of the world. So I think we need to remember how important all of us are. And that's why Macaulay itself may be a very small college, but it's an incredibly important experiment in the heart of this globally 
tremendously significant place, a place that so many of our ancestors really worked hard to get to, some very recently. And in my class, we talked a lot about very recent uh, tra travels of refugees and other kinds of immigrants just to get to the safety of New York only in the last 10 years in many cases. Mm -hmm. And so um, Lincoln restored a sense of America's moral grandeur to ourselves and then by extension to the rest of the world. And if we as New Yorkers can keep an eye on the same thing and treat each other well, and I think New Yorkers by and large do that. I'm not from New York, but I just love the way people interact on the street and act with civility in a subway car. You stand up when an older person needs a seat or you say hello to the corner grocery. You know, there are just all these little rituals of civility that are also part of democracy. It's not just voting. It's treating people with civility. And I think um, New York's great at that. Yeah, to be sure, and I, I will say uh, every uh, semester that I teach, I learn from my students. I'm inspired by them uh, and invigorated. Uh, and it is, uh, I mean, year after year, I, I walk away looking at an issue with a different perspective um, and I feel better for it. And in the context of New York, I mean, you're absolutely right uh, that New York, we are our own tipping point, right? That when we, when we tackle a problem, when we get something right, the whole country, the whole world watches. Um, right. And, you know, the, the, uh, the New York flag, if you take a look, it says Excelsior uh, underneath, right? You know, ever higher, um, ever upward. And for an aspirational city, uh, that is exactly it, right? Is that uh, we do have these uh, extraordinary and noble goals. We have not reached them, um, nevertheless that is the genius of New York is that we are, we are uh, aspiring. And that to me are the Macaulay students, yep. um, you know, ever higher striving. Absolutely. And, uh, and then to your point, and this is what Lincoln showed us. And I think this is what wave after wave of immigrants showed us, which is that actually is who America is. Uh, and Amen. It, it, yeah. So, it, and it, it is, um, you know, time and again, I think, I think that message has, has shown through. I, I love, I love okay, that. I love that we both got to just say how inspired we are by our students because I, I feel that every day. And I, I really think New York will once again lead us through these bad times. And, and I mean, it happened with 9 11, as we remember. And what was moving to me at the time, and I didn't live in New York then, was how um, New Yorkers from all different backgrounds came together in. At, time of 9-11 and I, I could see that happening uh, this spring too and now we really have to heal the rest of our country including the red states that are now in, in they're, they're hurting from the pandemic and the you know the one of New York's great messages to the rest of the country is we care about you and we'll send some of our people and our expertise and our doctors to help you because we got through it so yeah that is uh, that is exactly right and certainly my great hope I think, do we have a few more audience questions? Yes, and I, I'd like to say on behalf of all Macaulay students that thank you for saying that you are inspired by us because yeah. you know, we're, we're here because you guys are teaching us all the things, you know. But, um, well, you mentioned that New York is sending out help to other states and America is stronger when we are united, but it seems as though politics is more bipartisan than ever. Than ever. Is the political divide today greater than the one during Lincoln's day? And if so, do you see it being irreparable harm? To, to our democracy. I don't think it's quite as bad as when he was elected and then it got worse after he, he became president because we had the Civil War. So we're not, we're not sending armies into other parts of the country. Um, so so I, I think it, it's in some ways better. Uh, on the other hand, Lincoln wasn't dealing with a health emergency. And the Black Lives Matter protests are, are really tearing up our country in a way that African Americans simply could not achieve in the 1850s and 60s because they were largely congregated in the South and were denied any form of expression. So in some ways, we're having more of a debate than even at the time of 1861, but still 
for total seriousness, I think, you know, we have not yet um, been in a, in a war, but I do worry about long-term damage. Yes, I, I do. And that's why I, I think this election is so important. I, I worry about what the Republican Party will be after Donald Trump. And I, I actually would like a strong Republican Party. I think a two-party system is good for our country, but I would like a two-party system in which each party is admirable and they have different principled beliefs, but they don't tear each other down. And where this is going is, is just really negative. And I, I almost think the Republican Party will have to reinvent itself and find some things that it believes in, because if Donald Trump loses, I think the judgment of history will be pretty severe on him. And so we will need new reasons to believe in Republicans. And I, I hope they can find, I mean, there are Republican arguments for what, how to deal with climate change. And there could be many creative Republican ideas about um, saving the economy. We, we, we need also to rebuild our economy, which Lincoln didn't quite have to do. And we need two creative parties in which the best ideas come from some combination of these, these ideas in contest against each other. But right now it's just politics of personal destruction all the time. And some of that comes from the left, yes, but I, I think more of it comes from the right. And I, I wonder if, I mean, I guess we all are left to wonder of Lincoln's unfinished work uh, and how different a country would be had he not been assassinated. Because um, I mean, so much of what we saw, I mean, you mentioned the politics of it, uh, which was that, you know, the South becoming Democrat 100 years ago because, simply because Lincoln was a Republican uh, right. and, what, and what he was doing. When I look back at some of the clips that you, you quote in the book, I mean, it is as, as, as rough and tumble and as mean-spirited as the headlines are today, they were worse then. Uh, right. Some of the things that were written about what Lincoln was going to do um, uh, and how the freed slaves would, you know, everything from, you know, uh, essentially rape and pillage through towns across America. Um, and ultimately, when he is assassinated, I mean, so what I should say, Lincoln is, is his morality and his opposition to slavery is growing slowly throughout this period of time. His moral clarity is becoming clearer. Um, and ultimately, he's assassinated because of that. Would you say that's true? Yes, I would. Um, He's killed by John Wilkes Booth three days after a speech in which he promises to give some black Americans the vote. And so most historians feel that that's what sent Booth over the edge. Booth was a little unhinged anyway, but he, for a lot of the time he was plotting, he was thinking about kidnapping Lincoln. And then he decides to kill him. And many people believe it was because Lincoln was going to give Black Americans the vote. Yes, I, and I wonder, you know, I mean, there's so much to wonder and wish for in American history, but that if we would have begun to reconcile that original sin of slavery earlier and all the systemic, you know, how that cascades and all these damaging systemic ways earlier, uh, how much better generations of Americans uh, would have been. I think we would have had a a much better reconstruction had he lived. Um, and I think it's a little complicated to explain, but what happened was a very fast reconstruction happened because Congress was strong and was mad at the South. And President Andrew Johnson wasn't very powerful and he got impeached. And so a very rapid reconstruction happened that gave black people the vote immediately and there were a, a, a lot of uh, congressmen and senators elected and that enraged the white south and 11 years later in 1876 they arranged a kind of um, coup of sorts where they delivered some votes to help a president get elected rutherford b hayes and he agreed to relax Reconstruction, so it more or less just stopped. The corrupt bargain. Right, exactly. And with Lincoln, what I think we would have had would have been a slower 
better reconstruction that would have survived a lot longer. So that's a little controversial to say. Um, Lincoln's reconstruction might have been slower than what Congress did, which makes him look conservative and unattractive today. And there are reasons and, and people feel them. And there are a lot of things out there online, especially where people form very hasty judgments about how Lincoln wasn't as great on slavery as we want him to be. There's a lot of that flying around social media. But what Lincoln really was, in my opinion, is he was a kind of a political genius who made extraordinary changes happen while bringing in enough of the whole people behind him to make it stick. So if he'd been a kind of radical anti-slavery person, well, first of all, he never would have been nominated or elected. Um, and he would have had a lot of trouble getting his positions through Congress. But he always managed to find the moral center. And it was a mixture of, he argued very well about the ethics of a, of a problem, but then he also found allies in the middle of the country, in the North and the West. And he put, to, as you know, Eric, from working in politics, he would put together a coalition that would make an important change happen. Sometimes it happened slowly, sometimes it happened quickly. Um, emancipation, he, he um, snuck, that in in 18 over the course of 1862 it, it happens on january 1st 1863 and it was uh, probably the most significant action of a president of the united states since george washington and so when people doubt lincoln's credibility as a as a, an opponent of slavery i'm always a little bit incredulous because i i just want to say there was no one who was more of an abolitionist than abraham lincoln because he he abolished slavery in, in, in most of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So this is a more fun question. Um, in the course of researching for your book, what findings about Lincoln did you discover that surprised you the most? And for Professor Joya, when you were reading the book, what surprised you the most? That is fun. Um, I was surprised by um, his moral, uh, um, his mood, vacillations. Um, so I mentioned earlier, he, he could get depressed, which surprised me. We don't think of great leaders in our history as being capable of being depressed, but Lincoln was. And that actually made me like him even more. And there's an element of this story that's about mental health. There's a mental health specialist, Dorothea Dix, who discovers the plot and he helps save someone who suffers in a, in a way from mental health problems. Abraham Lincoln, although Lincoln has conquered his problems, but he still feels them. And that was another way of making Lincoln feel really um, genuine to me, not a perfect person, but a, a person with some flaws that we all can relate to. Um, and the, and he, he, over the course of the 13 days he's on the train, he makes a few blunders. He gives some bad speeches. And those appealed to me too, because I like the imperfect Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, <laughs> you know, having given some imperfect speeches myself, um, I uh, will say uh, in politics, you know, you have a body man, right? Someone who's always with you. Uh, and I really had wonderful uh, folks, aides uh, and good friends who would travel with me. And you know, they were really good because when you hop in the car, they'd look at you and say, you really weren't at your best tonight. Uh, that really wasn't that that good. <laughs> you'd say thanks, and you'd go to improve. And I thought of that when I when in reading. I think was it Pittsburgh where you thought he he kind of bombed. <laughs> yes, he, he gave a dud in Pittsburgh. Yeah, <laughs> he gave a dud in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and so you know, you think it was that John Hay next to him saying, "Boss, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you, you didn't have your fastball tonight." <laughs> um, but. Um, what surprised, so much surprised me in the book. I mean, I mentioned uh, the part about Dorothea Dix, but part, parts of what really interested me, and I guess it's a question I often ask, you know, you know where did leaders come from? How do you train leaders? Uh, is, is looking at young Lincoln and, and seeing some of his potential influences. I think you mentioned, we, I mean, we all know he's a great reader, but I think you mentioned in the book he reads um, 
uh, a Pilgrim's Progress uh, uh, by um, Bunyan, John Bunyan. Uh, and, and you could see that inspiring him and maybe setting off parts in his brain about, you know, the, the hero's journey, right? Um, right. And, and then there's another moment when you have him attending, just as a person in the crowd, a Ralph Waldo Emerson speech. Yeah. Uh, like type of power, you know? Right. And so I, I just wonder, is that, you know, is Abe Lincoln in the back of the, you know, the, I don't even know what it would be, the barn, right? Listening to Ralph Waldo Emerson thinking, all right, well, you know, that sounds good. Maybe I can do this. Well, thank you for noticing that, Eric. It really, you've over and over again picked out my favorite details. And I wanted him to be small at the beginning of the book because he, he gets so big at the end of the book. So I like him more in the audience than on stage at the beginning. And there's a little prologue where there's a prospector coming across the prairie and he just sees this like cloud on the horizon. And it's this stagecoach that gets bigger and bigger and inside is Lincoln who's almost coming out of the land itself. And, and um, I, I wanted to do that as a writer to have him come out of the wings before he takes over the whole story. I thought that was a little bit more effective. It, it was, it was, it was beautifully written. And, um, and, and I think just like those, those little boys walking in his shoes, that's what you allow the reader to do, right? Yeah. Not to see Lincoln fully formed. I think you call him, uh, you know, post the assassination, I think in our, in the, in the American mythology of him, you, I think say he becomes almost a New Testament figure. Uh, That's right. You know, of these, you know, heroic biblical proportions, but to see him all too human, uh, mm -hmm. I think is, is really, really uh, important. I think we're, we're wrapped, we're getting pretty close to time here. So maybe do, do we have maybe one more and then we'll wrap up. So this is more relevant to the pandemic and everything that's going with that. So if Lincoln were president today, how do you think he would handle the crisis? And what lessons could be learned from how he handled the nation when it was at war? What, a, what an interesting question. Um, he'd remind us that we're all part of one country. I'm, I'm worried sometimes that the goal of my democratic friends is to crush the right, not, not to win, but to just sort of end this period of our history. And we, we don't want to crush anyone. We want to come back into being one country and, and having a civilized conversation, not just in Congress, but over dinner tables and at Macaulay and everywhere. Um, I think he would welcome foreign leaders into a conversation about what is a global problem. He wouldn't say that, you know, my way or the highway. He'd say coronavirus is a, is a global disaster and we need to all help each other. So let's put the nationalist rhetoric aside and we can get some good medical ideas from China. They had it first and India is gonna have a big problem. We can help them maybe. And let's distribute our own medical teams around the U.S. in a wise way to help our, our, our one country recover well. Um, I think in the act of healing from the pandemic, he would be searching for economic recovery and he would try to make it fair. He would try to make all Americans benefit from a, a, a real recovery that is spread out across classes, across genders, across races. If you, I mean, the African American community has been suffering, and so has the Native American community, at higher levels than other communities. So, if they're suffering more, then the recovery ought to help them more. And he would just achieve balance. He he would, and he would explain the balance was a proper goal for a, a president. So that everything he did, he would step back and say, "What I'm doing isn't for my constituency; it's for our entire people." And by the way, our entire people are also on the side of the entire world as we fight through this thing. And climate change, like COVID, is an international problem. It's not created by any one country. And it, it's, it's, we all suffer from it equally. We will suffer even more if we don't do anything about it. So I think he'd be thinking long term. There were a few examples of like the Morrill Act, an act that created um, the funding 
for the state universities of the Midwest and West that were long-term solutions. And I think he'd, yeah, sure, he'd solve the immediate crises, but he'd be thinking long-term. And that's why we remember him as one of our greatest presidents. Yeah, well said. And just to add to that, Ted's words from the book where he describes Lincoln, he says, a clear thinker who studied his country's past, charted the best course he could and, straight, and stayed true to it, his moral compass um, untarnished. Thanks. And so, yeah, and that is an intellect with values and morals um, looking at us as one American family. Um, and, you know, I think whenever you elect a leader or send someone to Washington, I mean, no one is perfect uh, and no one will have all the answers. But if you have that combination, that really is what you hope for an intellect, a heart, and good values. That seems like a beautiful note to end on, but just before we leave, the audience do, does have some questions on where they can find the book. So Professor Whitmore, would you like to so, answer the question? Thank you. I want to thank Eric and Suhaima for the brilliant job you both did. And I'm, um, I'm so happy that Suhaima and I can be together again after our class ended. But Eric, your, your questions just went to the heart of the book. You really intuitively understood what I was trying to say, so, so thank you. Um, the book is on Amazon. There was a month-long period in May where you couldn't get it for pandemic-related reasons. It was hard to move boxes of the books on trucks, but not, now I think you can get it on Amazon. Um, I don't know the extent to which Barnes & Noble stores are reopened yet in, in New York City, but it, I expect it will be in there. I, I think you can already get copies on the used book providers like ABE books. Um, but also I, I wanted to say if anyone from Macaulay, including alums, would ever like to, we can't really meet in person right now, but if you wanna shoot me an email, happy to talk. If you didn't get to ask a question today, I'm so happy to be a part of this community. So just feel free to email me and we can keep it going that way. Well, thank you everybody. And thank you, oh, go ahead. So how many you can close? Yeah, so thank you for everyone who attended today and asked the great questions. Thank you, everyone. Okay.